And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brother Bill here for another edition of Sunday Talk here on this. Yeah, Sunday. We do it on Sunday. And uh, we have uh, in our studios this afternoon uh, the chief uh, medical officer of Self Regional Healthcare, who was on with us a few months ago, uh, Dr. Matt Logan. Matt, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for having me back. Oh, it's good to have you back with us once again. And as I recall, in retrospect, the last time you were here, we didn't have a vaccine. But thank God we've got a vaccine now. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, the vaccine, I think, is kind of the, a little ray of hope that we can all hold on to. And uh, mm -hmm. as we start getting it um, distributed out and around our communities, um, hopefully we can get on the other side of this COVID um, disease process and um, keep our communities he healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in looking at the uh, news and numbers from the CDC here recently, it seems like our numbers are getting better. Uh, least uh, hospitalizations are down. Yes, um, it, it, we have seen a nice uh, reduction, thank goodness, over the last couple of weeks. Um, here in Greenwood at Self Regional, we peaked with about 85 um, patients in the hospital with COVID about three weeks ago. Um, and that's slowly starting to come down. As of this morning, we're back down to 42 patients, which is still a lot, a lot more than we want to see, but at least it seems to be heading in the right direction. What we think we're seeing are that big surge that we had during the month of December and January was, was likely related to people just getting together with their family and loved ones over the holidays. We really started seeing the numbers increase after Thanksgiving. That continued through the month of December. And then after Christmas, we had another just really a big, bolus, huge surge of, uh, of, of really sick patients come to our hospital. Um, and, um, and then, you know, some of our sickest patients, when they get admitted, sometimes they're there for 20 or more days. Um, even those that go home are able, you know, to survive. Even those uh, sometimes are in the hospital for a long time. Um, and so we are starting to see those, again, from those, those periods and also New Year's uh, at this point um, uh, heading the right direction. So hopefully, hopefully that will continue. What has been the longest length of a patient suffering from COVID-19 their stay in the hospital? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I know several patients who've been there a month and a half or longer. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, typically the, the population over 70 years old, if they end up um, getting like to the point where they're so sick, they have to be put on a ventilator. Um, very few of those survive um, if they have to be put on the ventilator. Um, that's one thing that the nation has learned about uh, treating COVID inpatients is you do everything you can to try to keep them off the ventilator. That seems to be a, a definite increased risk of, uh, of mortality. Uh, one of the things we're doing at our hospital, in addition to the other medication treatments, is we're using a high flow oxygen uh, therapy, which basically is just a high flow oxygen directly um, into the, uh, you know, in the patient's face that yeah. they inhale in rather than being forced in via intubation. And, uh, and that seems to have made a big difference for some of our sickest patients. All right, before we get into the vac vaccination aspect of, of the topic and our conversation this afternoon, I saw an interesting piece about a nurse who did a video, and her job is what you just uh, mentioned, intubation. And they, the video has been viewed over almost a million times. Tell us the aspect of intubation, what, what, what takes place? Okay, sure. Um, so we only intubate people if they're in, uh, have a severely low oxygen level or they're having a, a different type of respiratory failure where their carbon dioxide level is too high in their bloodstream. It basically is your, your lungs are given out or your ability to breathe uh, and, and get oxygen into your body and mm -hmm. carbon dioxide out has reached a point where uh, you're not able to main, maintain homeostasis or to keep your body going. Um, when you get to that severe respiratory state, again, from COVID, it's typically from a low oxygen level. Mm -hmm. um, in, in really bad COVID, you get a COVID pneumonia where your fluids basically get like this fluid that fills up in it and, and you can't get it out with normal like medicines like diuretics. 
like Lasix and things like that, you otherwise would pull fluid out. It won't come out with that. Um, and when it gets so bad, you can't get that oxygen in. And the only way to get oxygen into those people is to truly force it in with a tube. So mm. what happens during the process of intubation is someone is given a medicine that sedates them and kind of makes you go to sleep. And then we use a, a, a basically a, a little handheld device called a laryngoscope that we put into the mouth and we visualize the vocal cords and we put a breathing tube through the vocal cords. And, uh, and that's the intubation process. And then they get put on a ventilator, which is a machine that forces air in and then allows carbon dioxide to come out. So we're able to oxygenate people like that. Um, there is, there, the risk of it is, though, that when someone's on that type of breathing for a while, instead of pulling air, you're pushing air in. Pushing. And it, causes, it can cause damage to the lungs over a period of time. And when folks don't, aren't able to, to get off the ventilator in a timely fashion, that's, that's the biggest risk, or one of the biggest risks of being on ventilation for a long time. So I get these daily reports from George McKinney, and mm -hmm. when it lists uh, six patients on ventilation, are they intubated yes. as well? Okay. Yeah, that, that's what that means. Yeah, all right. I was wondering because I would say, well, is this ventilation is those just the tubes or is it oh, actually yeah. intubation? But it is intubation. Yeah, that's intubation. We provide that data to George. Uh huh. So, yeah, that, those are our patients who are on the ventilator machine and are okay. intubated. And when a patient is intubated, are they sleep the whole entire time? Well, we, we will keep people sedated. Um, we do let people come off of sedation enough to where their own respiratory drive will kick in. Again, that allows us to reduce how much air we're forcing in and allows mm -hmm. the patient to pull to, so they can keep their respiratory muscles strong. Mm -hmm. So we don't keep you like fully sedated the whole time. We do allow folks to kind of, I don't say wake up, but kind of to, to arouse to a point where you're um, your normal respiratory drive will kick in some. But for the most part, the majority of people that end up being on the ventilator don't have any recollection of, of being on the ventilator. They just know that they were getting ready to get intubated, and then they remember when they came off the ventilator. Wow. Wow. Okay. Because I know I've heard a lot of, of uh, talk about intubation and, you know, a lot of uh, medical people say if they, they don't like to do it unless they have to, as you explained. Right. So all the more reason why wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance, and get this vaccination. Absolutely. Listen, we, we don't want anyone to have to be intubated from COVID. And, um, you know, uh, honestly, uh, the more people we can vaccinate, uh, the vaccines are highly effective, way more effective than, like, say, the flu vaccine, for example. Um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines mm -hmm. are both like 94, 95% effective at preventing severe COVID disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the flu vaccine, it's only around 60% on a good year. So mm -hmm. it's uh, way more effective than the flu vaccine. And uh, Moderna and Pfizer, this is a new medical technology. Well, kind of. Um, it is the first time that we've used an mRNA-based mm -hmm. vaccine um, for, uh, for treating a viral infection. That is true. Now, mRNA vaccines themselves have actually been around for about 20 years. They've been used in healthcare, specifically in like cancer areas, mm -hmm. um, where they would they can take uh, cancer cells and um, identify some of the proteins and uh, and sequence uh, RNA sequences within there and code for those and actually elicit your immune response to help fight certain cancers. Um, and that's actually been researched for over 20 years. Um, the fascinating thing to me about these RNA vaccines is, is they're so effective and they code for the exact protein that uh, is on the outside of the COVID. And it's, to me, it, it's an amazing technology that we are so fortunate to have um, available uh, in our in our day and time. If, if COVID, for example, had come around, say, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have RNA vaccines. There wouldn't be enough information on how to create this, and it would be a much bigger uh, ordeal to try to get it under control. But um, several of the other vaccines as well at least use some type of an RNA-based based technology mm -hmm. uh, for, for creating the immune response. Okay. So, you know, that's one of the biggest quips I've heard about. A lot of people talk about the vaccine. Uh, it was developed too quickly. But what you're telling me and what I'm hearing is that this was a, a, a medical science that was already in existence. All it needed to do was to be tweaked exactly. to get it to it. So it was, it, it was, it was truly wasn't developed and just boom, like that. 
Exactly. This is a, is a technology that's been around for, like I said, over 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's just the first time that this technology has been applied to a viral infection mm -hmm. uh, and, and to create a vaccine with it versus some of the other injections with our RNA-based injections that treat other disease processes. But uh, it's, it's, it's truly fascinating. And to me, it's one of the marvels of science that wouldn't have, again, wouldn't have been available 20 years ago that is today because of that research and the length of time that, you know, RNA-based uh, treatments have been uh, been studied. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about, uh, I know a lot of people who have been keeping up with this. One of the to topics or what's being used as a phrase that right now we're in a race against the variants. Talking about the South African variant, uh, the UK variant, the Brazilian variant, uh, trying to get ahead of the game and the positive thing is they're saying that these vaccines are still uh, potent against uh, 19 and these variants. Yeah, that's true. Um, you may be quoting Dr. Ashish Jha. He's the dean of the School Dr. of Public Jha, Health. Dr. Jha, my yeah. friend. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's the dean of School of Public Health up at Brown University. He used to be at, uh, at Harvard School of Public Health. Mm -hmm. um, but he, um, he actually was, uh, was speaking recently and also had a... Um, uh, some tweets he sends out tweets frequently and that's mm -hmm. exactly what he said is and he's right it's truly a race right now between um, is can a, a mutation develop within COVID that'll make our vaccines not work mm -hmm. or can we get the vaccine out there to really tamp down the COVID in the community to where there's not enough you know people with COVID to allow the the variants to to evolve. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, exactly. It's a race between getting the vaccine out there and a race for the variants. Now, fortunately, like you mentioned, the vaccines we have right now do appear to be uh, still effective at preventing severe COVID disease. They're still doing a lot of research on it, but we, the best thoughts right now are that they do still work. Mm -hmm. And once again, going back just a little ways in the conversation, you were talking about the protein. We're talking about that spike protein that's on the COVID-19 virus right that's correct yeah the um, the the mrna vaccines they code for a specific protein that is found on the outside of the covid virus mm -hmm. that spike protein um, is what allows the the virus to enter into our cells and people i, and I hear people like oh i don't want to get that rna inside me from that vaccine well do you know what happens when the, you get infected with covid what happens is that spike protein on the outside of the virus binds to your cells and injects about 30 strands of RNA inside your cell. And it takes over your inside of your cell, it kills the cells that it infects, and it releases millions of viruses, including the coding of all those different strands of RNA. The RNA vaccine is one strand of that RNA that only codes for that protein. That protein is released by your cell into, into your body. Your mm -hmm. body recognizes that as a foreign protein that shouldn't be there, mm -hmm. and it activates your immune system to create antibodies as well as something called T, uh, T cells, which uh, basically last, allow the immunity to last a lot longer than the actively current circulating antibodies. So it's a very robust immune response that you get to the vaccine. In fact, the immune response to the vaccine is even greater than if you contract COVID itself. Um, I was fortunate to be able to participate on a conference call with Tim Mullinex. Tim Mullinex is the uh, medical director for Pfizer, uh, Pfizer's vaccine development team. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and one of the things he shared was exactly that. In their study population of the Pfizer vaccine, again, this is 44,000 people they studied, mind you, um, that uh, the immune response and the antibody titers months after uh, the vaccine were significantly higher than if you had COVID itself. So it, uh, it does provide a, a good, and we anticipate a long lasting immune response. Um, again, the jury is still a little out on how long you may, it may need to go before you get a booster. Um, I anticipate it will be at least one year, possibly two years. Um, they're going to continue to follow these folks that have been in the study and, uh, you know, check their antibody titers and whatnot over a period of about two years. Um, and, and that'll really help us to know. Okay, and uh, I'm hearing now that Moderna and Pfizer, they're already working on, I guess you could call it in normal layman terms, updating where they can, with these variants, where they can make an adjustment with not having to go through a trial, but in 100 days that they'll be able to make that adjustment to if, the, if it gets to that point and change the vaccine 
to fight these variants. Exactly. They've already identified the uh, the changes, the mutations in the um, the RNA sequences that cause the change in the spike protein. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about variants, what we're truly talking about is that there there have been some changes. Again, when this virus replicates millions and millions of times, there'll be some errors in the replication process, and some of those errors um, result, result in a change in the shape of the, the viral protein. And uh, that's what, and, and some of those changes in shape allow it to infect us easier. Mm. Um, so that's that's, that's kind of what's happening. That's why they're saying transmissible, more transmissible. Exactly. And so, um, and really, all they have to do is identify the RNA that codes for that different shaped protein, and mm -hmm. then they can just simply ch s barely change the RNA sequence, and uh, and give a booster if folks are already have had vaccine, or just change the specific uh, vaccine just a little bit by tweaking the RNA in the vaccine. Uh, so again, a fascinating technology, and it's, uh, it's again, we're just really fortunate to live in a time when we do when something when this we're able to make those type of changes so quickly. Mm. You can think of it kind of like the the flu shot. Every year, the the flu strain is a little bit different, and uh, and so the 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 flu shot has a little bit different. Uh, components in it every year, which mm -hmm. allows you to uh, develop an immune response to the anticipated strain that'll be out that year. Very similar process. All right, let's get to another problem we're having with the vaccination. That's who and who is not getting vaccinated. And this piece I have here, and it states that black Americans have suffered one of the highest death rates from COVID-19 with one out of 735 black Americans dying from the disease, according to the latest data for white Americans, that figure is one in every 1,030 persons. So yet white Americans are being vaccinated at rates of up to three times higher than black Americans. That's early data from the 23 states that are reporting racial and ethnic data on vaccinations show. Yeah, as as a country, we need to do a better job. Mm -hmm. um, there's a vaccine hesitancy or um, uh, kind of a mistrust of the vaccine. I think that's uh, was rampant across any race or demographic. But um, I I think there may be some of that. There's also uh, there's also just uh, health disparities and um, you know social determinants of health and things like that that maybe keep people from reaching out to get vaccines. Um, from a healthcare facility that's giving vaccines, we would love to give it to anybody, regardless of your skin color. It makes no difference at all. Um, we're following the CDC and the D, well, our DHEC guidelines um, specifically in regards to the categories of people that can get vaccinated, um, and um, uh, we're we're starting with that. And they're all they're not they're race is not part of that. It's all it's mm -hmm. age age mm -hmm. re related mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and kind of healthcare provider related. Um, I look forward to um, the day, and it, hopefully it's not going to be too long, where we can do more outre outreach to the communities. And, um, and for example, um, you, you're aware of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, currently, the problem, one of the problems that we have uh, with outreach right now to some of the underserved communities is just the outreach process itself and mm -hmm. the type of vaccines that we have. Um, and I'll speak specifically for the hospital. We have um, a Pfizer vaccine. That's mm -hmm. the, the type that we have uh, within Self Regional to, to give out. That one has very strict storage requirements. It requires freezers that will keep that vaccine at negative 80 degrees Celsius uh, to keep it from spoiling. You can think of it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Our RNA has to be kept really cold. And um, we didn't even have those freezers at our hospital. When, when COVID started, we were anticipating the vaccine. We reached out to the Greenwood Genetic Center. The Greenwood Genetic Center loaned us two of their large negative 80 degrees Celsius freezers so that we could ha be able to vaccinate our mm -hmm. community. Um, but because of those uh, storage requirements, um, when you thaw one of our vaccines, we have to use it within five to six hours or it spoils and you have to throw it away. Wow. It makes outreach really, really hard. 
Um, once we get some different other vaccines that available to us, we look forward to going out and doing more outreach uh, in, in the underserved mm -hmm. communities and bring the vaccine to them. Because right now we don't have the ability to do that. We have to bring the patient to the vaccine at the hospital where it's close and we kind of have some processes in place to try to get people through. Um, I think you're aware of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There's been a lot of talk about that in the news recently. I think this will be a, a great addition to the vaccine armament. Yes and um, uh, will allow us to, to really, really do more of those type of events where you, so just a one shot dose versus the Pfizer requires two shots and the cold storage requirements are not nearly as strict. It can be stored um, in, in just a, like a regular freezer Frigor refrigerator. refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it doesn't require um, you know, such strict uh, cold temperature requirements and it seems to be pretty effective uh, as well. Um, the overall numbers may be a little bit lower than the uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, but uh, still, you know, 80, 85 percent of preventing severe disease and those that progress to death is like extremely low. Um, uh, so it's preventing the severe disease, which is really kind of, you know, mm -hmm. keeping people from mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. If you can turn a COVID infection to kind of like a runny nose or a cold instead of like in the ICU on the ventilator, uh, then that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I think that's definitely one of the one of the next steps uh, to to fight this thing. I was reading where uh, a gentleman stated after he got his second um, shot of the vaccine, well, he had some side effects, uh, especially chills and stuff, and uh, he said he had his wife would have to put two blankets on him, and then five ten minutes take it off. Put it back on, but he made this statement. He said, I'd rather have to use two blankets than be infected with COVID. Boy, absolutely. That that is I will echo that. Mm -hmm. Um it's the thing about COVID that is I think is so challenging. It's like none of us want to I don't well, none of us want to harm anybody else. We want to, mm. you know, keep others around us mm. safe. But you can have COVID and really have such mild symptoms you don't even hardly know you have it. Mm -hmm. You may have like a runny nose or you know, may think you have like a little mild sinus or something like that. And um, uh, meanwhile, like you're visiting with your family and you let your guard down, take your mask off and you give your parent who may be elderly a COVID infection who ends up in the intensive care unit. Um, and you didn't even know you had it. That's mm -hmm. the thing that's so insidious about the about COVID. Um, so, yeah, I would echo that. But the severe, the bad cases of COVID, you don't want that. It's mm -hmm. a it's a bad, bad, bad process. And uh, so I, I definitely encourage your listeners to please, as soon as you are able to, uh, to reach out and get the vaccine. I'm just going to just briefly, if you're okay, Brother Bill, just kind of tell how you can get a vaccine at Self Regional, if that's okay. Go ahead. Awesome. So uh, we have uh, two main ways. Um, the, uh, the simplest way would just be to call. We have our phone lines open Monday through Friday from 9 to 5, and that number is 725-3555. Um, and um, uh, there may be a little bit of a wait, um, but if you hang on the line, we'll get to you as quick as we can. The other option is our web form. Um, and we have it online for those that have internet access. Um, if you just go to our website, uh, selfregional.org, at the very top of that page, there's a link that you can follow. And then within that link, it talks about some uh, COVID just in general. Mm -hmm. And then there's a link to a web form. And uh, for those young folks that are your listeners, y'all get out there and help your, help your parents, help your grandparents get signed up. Um, they may have a little difficulty with, uh, with a web form or internet, internet access or whatnot. You can do this on your phone, on your cell phone, your smartphone. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you can go to the website, fill out that form for them. Um, and, uh, and help them get them signed up to get vaccinated. Um, we, uh, starting Monday, we're vaccinating anyone who's 65 years and older. Um, we're starting next week um, with that group. And uh, we have been and up I'm to... And I'm in that group. <laughs> <laughs> well, come get you a vaccine, <laughs> brother Bill. Group, yeah. You come on and get you one. We'll yeah. be glad to do that for you. Um, one thing I just want to, to, to share with your listeners in regards to the age, there's been some thoughts of like, why, why, why are the older people getting to go first? It's because they're severely affected with, uh, with COVID when they get it. And I'll just share some statistics from the CDC with you real quick. Mm -hmm. For those that are 65 years and older, they account for only 14.3% of the overall COVID infections, but they account for 81% of the deaths. So that small population of 14.3 who get COVID account for 81% of the deaths. So those 65 and older, mm -hmm. I really want to emphasize to your listeners, please, if you have uh, 
uh, if you yourself are in that bracket or if you have family members in that bracket, encourage them to come get the vaccine. It's safe. It's effective. It's going to save lives. I, I really feel it's going to. Um, a little update from Self Regional on our vaccine so far. Um, we have given, um, as of yesterday, um, a total of first-time doses, 12,891 first-time doses. So that's 12,891 individuals who have received the vaccine. Uh, for the first time, we've given a total injections of 16,171. So some of those are second doses, but uh, 12,891 individuals have at least received their first dose. Um, and we're, uh, of those that have received their first dose um, and are waiting on their second one, we're, we're of course, working through that uh, every week. Um, we give first doses and second doses every week uh, to try to get everybody that full 95% protection rate uh, after the second dose. All right. Is there anyone that shouldn't get the vaccination due to allergic reactions to other types of medicine or something? That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so uh, <clears throat> specifically, um, um, the only really contraindication to get the COVID vaccine is if you've had an allergic reaction to a prior COVID vaccine. For example, you got the first injection and you had a severe allergic reaction mm -hmm. to it, you shouldn't get the second one. Um, that would be one reason. And then it also, if you're, again, folks would probably know this, if you're allergic to polyethylene glycol, uh, that's an ingredient within the vaccine mm -hmm. uh, that is found in some, uh, uh, some other food products and it's a preservative. And, uh, but if, if you would have had allergic reaction likely to something else, it's a very unusual uh, type of allergic reaction and um, it's unlikely that's going to happen. Um, I'll just give you some stats on that real quick. Um, the statistic is about five out of one million injections will develop an anaphylactic reaction. So it's pretty infrequent. Um, and um, in regards to like what do we do to, to watch out for that, um, because of that risk, anyone who gets an injection at self-regional and basically everywhere mm -hmm. as you get watched for a 15-minute period if you're going to develop one of those severe allergic type reactions it's typically going to be within the first 15, 15 minutes of getting minutes. the injection mm -hmm. so we you get your injection you have to wait for a 15-minute observation period during that observation period we have nurses and physicians uh, in the area that if you develop that we have an anaphylaxis kit that's got everything we need to treat anaphylaxis right there on site um, so it's no waiting to run to the ER or anything like that we have have uh, EpiPens as well as you know steroids and those other medicines that mm -hmm. we use to treat severe allergic reactions if it were to happen. Now I'll say in that 16,171 injections we've given we've not had any no anaphylactic reactions here yet but again the risk is about five out of a million and just for reference penicillin injection is one out of five thousand. Risk, risk of developing a severe anaphylactic reaction mm -hmm. to penicillin. So when you put it in that perspective, if you had a severe uh, strep throat infection, would you take a shot of penicillin? A lot of people said, well, yeah, I'd take a shot of penicillin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your risk is way higher from that penicillin shot than it is from a COVID shot. So, wow. um, But typical uh, other, other type um, um, medications, um, not really. Um, folks who are allergic to eggs can take it. Folks who are allergic to peanuts can take the COVID vaccine. What about fish? Fish, you can take the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. No problem at all. Lisinopril. And I'm mm -hmm. on that. No I'm problem. Having, yeah, I have you, a, a yeah. reaction to the lisinopril. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no problem with folks with prior lisinopril angioedema or problems like that. No mm -hmm. problems at all. You can take the COVID vaccine. Um, so it's really very few uh, contra, absolute contraindications to taking it. Uh, which is also awesome. A lot right. of people take it. And finally, and uh, we talked about this before the program started, uh, Matt, that it is crucial that everybody gets this vaccine because if we can't do it in a widespread manner, meaning that 60% of the population takes it, the other 40% doesn't, we can't develop that herd immunity. Brother Bill, I think you, me, everybody else wants to get back to some kind of normalcy. Um, <clears throat> I hate wearing my mask when I get out of my car, or put it on to go in the hospital or mm -hmm. go to the store or whatnot. I do it to protect those around me, even mm -hmm. though I've been vaccinated. I still, it's important that we protect those around us, but I would love not to have to. Um, and until we can get to a herd immunity level of, uh, of immunity to COVID in the, in the community, we're not, we, we can't do that. Um, we can't get back to normal. And you're right. It's going to take somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of people will either have had to contract COVID or get a vaccine. And like we talked about already, it's much better to get that vaccine than to contract the COVID. 
Um, so um, uh, if we're going to get back to normal and, and get back to, you know, safety and not worrying about things as much and being able to have family dinners and hug our family and kids and loved ones and go visit our grandparents without worrying about infecting them, um, we've got to get vaccines and get them out as quick as we can to as many people as we can and get to that herd immunity level. You said something, and I know I said one more question, but you just brought up something that I have seen people doing. They get infected with COVID. Then after they get over it, they say, I've got the antibodies and go around with no mask on or not being considerate of somebody who hasn't. And they're under the impression they can't get infected again. But with these new variants out there, that's not a gimme. I agree with you. It's uh, <clears throat> certainly possible that, that you can get reinfected. Now, I will say that the majority of the time, if you, have, if you could track COVID, you will have antibodies that will last somewhere between three and six months. Mm. And your, your individual chance of getting reinfected is pretty low during that three to six month period after you have COVID. Um, however, uh, that immunity does start to wane. We know around three months. Um, and there have been cases where folks have been reinfected and there's still some unknowns around it. I mean, it, we just have to continue to wear our masks and social distance until there's a herd immunity level in the community. Even with vaccine, after vaccine, like I mentioned before, the vaccine at 95% effective rate still leaves one in 20 people who will contract COVID even though they had the vaccine. Uh, it will dramatically reduce it. And once enough people have that immunity level, mm -hmm. the, the COVID will go away. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. But until we get to the herd immunity level, it's still important that we uh, uh, continue to wear our masks and, and social distance and practice those other you know, safety precautions. Yeah, and one notable person that was reinfected twice, and I, I forgot to mention, uh, Frank Martin, basketball coach of, of USC, was yeah. infected a second time, and he said the second time almost took him down. Yeah. So I don't know the, the span or the time frame that he was infected the first time to the second time, but you can get infected twice. You can, and that brings up another good point, too. Um, if you've had COVID, you should still get the vaccine. Um, we are recommending that, well, the CDC and DHEC, and of course we're at the hospital, are also recommending that once you're over your infection and you're past your quarantine period, which is typically uh, 10 days from symptom onset and you've been without symptoms for at least 24 to 48 hours, mm -hmm. once you're past that period, you can go ahead and get the vaccine. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like I mentioned before, um, the, uh, the vaccine will give you an added boost to your immunity uh, even beyond just having that recent COVID infection and also appears to last longer uh, than COVID infection. So uh, even if you've had COVID, you should go ahead and get vaccinated. All right. Any final word, Matt? No, just uh, just really get out there, guys. Really try to – your loved ones, the ones you care about um, – who are over 65, encourage them next week to, to start reaching out and see if we can get them vaccinated. Um, and I so said, we're happy to do it. Um, and, uh, and also continue to practice social distancing and wearing your masks and uh, good hand hygiene, those type things uh, for the time being until we get to that herd immunity level. We're gonna get on the other side of this. I don't think this is a forever thing that we're gonna be dealing with, but you know, for the short term, uh, just hang in there a little bit longer. If we can get another six months or so down the road and get a bunch of people vaccinated, uh, maybe we can, uh, can get this thing beat. One thing we wanna emphasize, and I know you will agree with me, this is Super Bowl Sunday. Please, they're asking you, just your family, just your family, because we don't need to see another surge. Lord, I agree with you on that. I thank you for thank you for mentioning that, uh, Brother Bill. That's that's exactly the truth. Um, watch it with folks that that live in your home, those mm -hmm. that you live in your home with, that you're kind of, you know, in your bubble if you want to think of it that way. That that you're around without your mask at the at the house every day. Watch it with those people. Don't have big, large gatherings with a bunch of food out and um, all those things that I know I love to do too. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't the year for it. Maybe next Super Bowl will be the time for yeah. that for that party. But yeah, don't let's don't turn uh, turn a, a Super Bowl party into a COVID party and uh, and end up two weeks later with with a bunch of of our sick family members. I agree. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Dr. Matt Logan, Chief Medical Officer at Self Regional Healthcare. He's been our guest. This afternoon on Sunday Talk, Matt, please feel free to come back anytime. 
Thank you, Brother Bill. And if there's anything specific you ever want me to come back and talk about, just let me know. I will be glad to do that. Let's go to Australia. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> All right, then. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Matt. All right.